3,000 years ago, an extraordinary people rose from humble beginnings to force their will on the world and create the greatest empire mankind had ever seen. An empire that stretched from Britain to the Middle East, lasted a thousand years and shaped the way we live today. I'm Larry Lamb, actor, radio presenter and history fanatic. I'm like a kid at Christmas. In this series, I'm traveling back beyond the marble monuments to ask who these people were and why they were so successful. Wow. From the empire's earliest ruins to her first conquests in Africa. From kingdom to republic, from Romulus and Remus to Julius Caesar, I want to uncover the extraordinary story of how Rome became the world's first superpower. BC, a century of bitter warfare is about to reach its climax. Rome's forces are poised outside the city walls of their greatest enemy. Carthage must be destroyed. For six days, the Romans mercilessly annihilated everything and everyone in their path. They left the city and the Carthaginian civilization utterly devastated. During this savage attack, one young nobleman proved himself a brave and gifted officer. His name was Tiberius Gracchus. In 146 BC, Tiberius Gracchus was just a teenager. But listen to what Plutarch had to say about him. The younger Tiberius soon learned to understand that commander's nature and led all the young men in discipline and bravery. Yes, he was the first to scale the enemy's wall. A teenager, first one over the wall. Tiberius left Carthage a hero, but he would soon face a far greater enemy. This would be a battle between the wealthy ruling classes and the ordinary citizens of Rome, a fight for the very soul of the Republic. With the fall of Carthage, Rome's influence now stretched thousands of miles across the Mediterranean. Nothing stood in the way of the Republic's ambition to conquer the known world. Each victory of the army brought unimaginable riches. War tribute of slaves, treasure and art poured into the nation's coffers. This immense fortune was enjoyed by a privileged few. The ruling classes were becoming addicted to the trappings of their own success. An addiction that was eating away at the very character of the Republic itself. The Romans liked to think their success was due to their humble origins as peasant farmers. It was all about honest, hard work and discipline, no fancy stuff. But now, with all this extra disposable wealth sloshing around, I wonder how true that was. I mean, they say money is the root of all evil. And some of these guys were making fortunes. Dazzled by their own prosperity, the Roman elite began to lose sight of the traditional values of their ancestors. With the front line now thousands of miles away, they cared less and less about the common people who fought their wars and more about feathering their own nests. I've come to Baia in the Bay of Naples to see for myself the level of opulence enjoyed by the privileged upper classes. Today, it's a busy seaside resort, popular with tourists and locals from all walks of life. In Tiberius Gracchus's time, this was the playground of the super-rich. 
the Las Vegas of the ancient world. The Stoic philosopher Seneca was so shocked by the debauchery he witnessed here, he branded it a resort of vice. In fact, he left after a day in total disgust, moaning about drunks on the beach, rowdy parties on boats, people singing and dancing along the quayside, to say nothing of all the other goings on. Things don't change much, do they? What has changed is the landscape itself, sculpted by 2,000 years of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Look around today, and there's little evidence of the spectacular surroundings of the past. But incredibly, this ancient wonder is still here, now submerged beneath these waves. statues once adorned the villas of Rome's wealthiest aristocrats, including the mighty Julius Caesar. It's an astonishing sight. Street after street of fantastically preserved ruins offer glimpses of its former magnificence. These mosaics, for instance, conceal the ultimate symbol of Roman luxury. Underfloor heating, known as the hypercourse, was invented right here at Bayer. Who developed this wonderful invention made an absolute fortune, but not from underfloor heating, but from another luxury item oysters. The nobility's insatiable appetite for them allowed Sergius Arata to establish an oyster empire here in Bayer. To keep the supply going through even the coldest of winters, he designed a system of artificially heated pools. This oyster-warming technology led directly to the underfloor heating that came to symbolise the pinnacle of Roman affluence. Oysters, heated floors, drunken debauchery. Life was pretty sweet, if you were wealthy. But as the young Tiberius Gracchus was about to see for himself, not everyone shared in such decadence and luxury. Tiberius would soon realize there was a critical flaw in Roman society, one that threatened the very soul of the Republic itself. The story of the young nobleman called Tiberius Gracchus begins at the very highest level of Roman society. He was born into a world of privilege, where heritage and ancestry meant everything. This mausoleum was designed specifically to broadcast the prominent status of those laid to rest here, whose families were amongst the most powerful in the Republic. So for 350 years, this whole complex of tombs was the final resting place for generations of the Scipio family. The man who wiped Carthage off the face of the earth was buried here. 
and probably before him, Scipio Africanus Major, the general who finally defeated Hannibal. Huh. Imagine. Since Rome's earliest beginnings, rich patrician families like the Scipios had dominated the Senate, holding all the political aces. Tiberius's connection to this ancient line of patricians and all the power and privilege that went with it was maternal. His mother was Cornelia Africana, the daughter of Hannibal's conqueror. His paternal family line was no less illustrious. Here too, Tiberius was at the very apex of Roman nobility. Both his father and grandfather had served as consul, the highest political office in Rome. But they were self-made men of plebeian stock who'd earned wealth and status through their own actions. Even so, the Gracchi remained strictly plebeian at heart. Plutarch has this to say about Tiberius's father. Although he had been censor at Rome, twice consul, and celebrated two triumphs, he derived his more illustrious dignity from his virtue. So obviously his father stood for the traditional values of the Republic. Honor, bravery, hard work, the very principles that had made Rome great. So it's clear to me that growing up, Tiberius would have been influenced by his father's sense of fair play. When Tiberius was still only a boy, his father died. But the influence the father had on the boy reached out from beyond the grave. This was achieved partly through a bizarre practice reserved solely for the aristocracy. To find out what it was and how it would have affected the path that the young Tiberius took, I'm paying a visit to this ceramics workshop. I'm volunteering myself as a human guinea pig. My face is my fortune, be careful. <laughs> Following the same methods used in ancient Rome, art historian Laurie Anne Touchette is going to create a funeral mask, a copy of my face, in wax. We're going to use Vaseline, although we've also brought some olive oil, right. so, which is probably what they used in ancient Rome. It will protect your face and also your eyelashes, your eyebrows. Yeah, don't pull them out. Oh dear, oh dear. Now that seems to be pretty good. Just keep your eyes closed. The first stage is to build up layers of plaster and gauze to create a mold, a negative from which the mask will be made. After what seemed like an eternity, I was finally ready to come up for air. <laughs> and you probably can step down directly. <laughs> the next stage involves building up layers of melted beeswax to create the mask. Thankfully, this left me free to find out more about how they were used. These masks were a tremendously important part of the theatrical spectacle aspect of funerals because if you were an important man during your lifetime, you would have your portrait cast in this manner. On your death, you would have an actor who played you, who actually had learned you during your lifetime. That actor would be joined with other actors or younger members of the family who would be impersonating the ancestors. But the influence that these masks exerted stretched well beyond the funeral ceremony. After their funeral, those wax portraits would go in the family home, almost certainly in the atrium, and there they would become a sort of reference point for mm. the people living in the home, for people who would come to visit. I mean, we, we actually think nothing of having a photo of 
old Uncle Joe or, you know, right. Granddad Bill or whatever else up on the wall. That's as close as they could get, really, wasn't it? It is. It is. And we know from the ancient sources that these were seen as a kind of incitement to greatness. The ancestors, the great men of Roman history, gave an example to the younger generation of how they should behave. Here he comes. There he is. <laughs> what a bizarre, a really bizarre sensation. I can rather well imagine young Tiberius Gracchus, as it were, growing up under the gaze of the old pater familias and reminding him constantly of all those republican values that he held so dearly. Always there, the old man. In 137 BC, nine years after proving himself at Carthage, Tiberius served as a diplomat in the fight against Numantia, one of the last cities in Spain still holding out against the Republic. The Roman army found themselves hopelessly surrounded by Iberian warriors. Only Tiberius' skills as a negotiator saved them from certain massacre. The peace deal he broke had spared the lives of 20,000 Roman soldiers, making him a hero of the people of Rome. But it was what he saw on the way to Numantia as he made his way through the Italian countryside that would shape this young man's destiny and that of the Republic itself. This is Tuscany, the essence of rural Italy. It's hard to imagine more beautiful, peaceful, idyllic setting. And it was still like that back in 137 BC, although then it was called Etruria. But whatever it was that Tiberius Gracchus witnessed on his way through here, would eventually drive him headlong into a deadly showdown with the very ruling classes he'd been born into. So what exactly was it that had such a profound effect on him? To find out, I need to try and retrace his steps. Along his route, Tiberius would have encountered hundreds of villas like this one at Setifinestra, built in the first century BC. Most of the present day structure dates from the 1500s when the Spanish were here. But in Tiberius's time, villas like this were the property of wealthy Roman landowners. They were the centerpieces of huge industrialized farms producing wine on a massive scale which in ancient Rome could mean only one thing. Plutarch wrote, as Tiberius was passing through Tuscany, he observed the dearth of inhabitants in the country and that those who tilled its soil or tended its flocks there were imported barbarian slaves. Of course, slaves, Spartacus and all that. I mean, I suppose like everybody else, my image of slaves and slavery does come from the films and television, but obviously slavery was a, a massively important part of Roman society. Can you say how important slaves were e effectively in the whole running of the, of the Roman system at that time? I think they were very important in Italy, not in the whole of the empire, but definitely in Italy. They're providing nine-tenths of your agricultural labor. They are providing all of the domestic labor. And they're doing a lot of the administration as well. So, I mean, this, I suppose, the kind of thing that we get from films or whatever, of slaves being chained, manacles, literally, you know, chained to the wall every night. Um, would this have been quite the case, or? I don't think so. I don't, we don't find many manacles in Italy. And it's gonna be hard to prune your vines if you're manacled. Yeah. I think the, the problem is that there's nowhere to escape to. Tiberius Gracchus saw how the wealthy Roman landowners were using this captive army of slaves to produce wine in vast quantities. 
This estate alone generated nearly 4,500 amphorae a year. That's roughly a quarter of a million bottles today. Where was the wine going? Now, the wine was mainly going to Gaul. The Gauls are consuming Italian wine in the most enormous quantities. It's been estimated that as much as 40 million amphorae from this area finished up in Gaul. Amphorae are exchanged in Gaul, one amphora for one slave. So those 40 million amphorae came back in the form of millions of slaves. Millions of slaves? Yeah. And of course, those slaves could then be put to work, producing even more wine. This self-generating success allowed the owners to multiply their wealth almost exponentially. I mean, these people are enormously rich. I think that's the, the, the moral of this story. The Roman aristocrats of the second and first centuries BC are just accumulating wealth in the form of landed property at the most enormous rate. For the already wealthy nobility, these massive slave-based enterprises were a license to print money. But it wasn't this embarrassment of riches that troubled Tiberius. Nor was it the suffering of millions of slaves. It was something else entirely. In that quote from Plutarch, he said, in Tuscany, Tiberius observed the dearth of inhabitants in the country. So what had become of them, these ordinary citizen farmers? BC. Still in his 20s, the young nobleman Tiberius Gracchus is returning to Rome from the wars in Spain. What he saw in the Italian countryside would change his life and the history of Rome forever. The fields were filled with the slaves of the wealthy nobility, not with Roman citizens as he would have expected. Tiberius knew that these citizen farmers made up the ranks of the Roman army. Many were away fighting in campaigns that had grown from months to years. But he also observed something far more sinister. The absence of veteran soldiers back from the wars. The farms that these soldiers had left in the care of their wives and children had been abandoned and then snapped up for a pittance by the owners of the huge slave estates. Worst of all, Tiberius knew that much of this land was public land, ager publicus, which the wealthy landowners had no right to take. According to Plutarch, a law had been passed around 250 years earlier, strictly limiting the amount of public land that could be owned by any one man to about 320 acres. But of course the rich weren't above using dirty tricks to get around this. Neighboring rich men, by means of fictitious personages, transferred these rentals to themselves and finally held most of the land openly in their own names. Basically, these wealthy landowners were stealing from the very people who had fought and died to keep Rome on top, and I mean, they were stealing it. They were doing this illegally. The brave few who battled on to bring their meagre crop to market found themselves undercut by the rich landowners. Forced to quit, they had no choice but to pack up and head for the city. Tiberius alone realized that this exodus of citizens threatened the very core of the Republic. Why? Because to join the army, you had to own land, by law. So, no farmers in the countryside meant 
no soldiers on the battlefield. What Tiberius saw on his return to Rome would trigger a desperate desire to fix the social imbalance that was tearing at the heart of the Republic. By now, the city's population was around a quarter of a million and rising fast. But for most, winter oysters and heated floors were the stuff of dreams. Far from the world of opulence enjoyed by the wealthy, the streets were crammed with the poor and dispossessed in their thousands. Throw in disease, hunger, poverty, and life couldn't have been much fun. And remember, these were citizens of Rome, many of whom had fought for the glory of the Republic. And this was their reward. The more fortunate ones did manage to find work and a place to stay. But just how fortunate were they? As I'm about to see for myself, the only living spaces available were a far cry from the marble villas of the rich. This brick building is the only surviving example of its kind left in Rome. It's called an insula, a multi-storey apartment block, typical of Roman housing in the late Republic. How many people would have lived in a building like this? We can imagine a sort of couple of hundred potentially. Really? It depends how many people you think can fit in a space. Across the road, would there have been another one and another one? Would this have been an area of these tenement blocks, as it they, were? There would be lots of tenement blocks down here because we're in the valley, yeah. whereas up on the hills, you'd have the aristocratic palaces. Because this area floods, so right. we have all the diseases which you might associate with big cities which are growing. You have TB, you have malaria. There must have been some sort of basic toilet facilities, water, would they have had a kitchen? Was there a chimney? How did, how did cooking work? There's no real sanitation type stuff. Right. Um, because there's a, there's a story of a chamber pot flying off one of these apartment blocks and hitting somebody on the head. But right. it is evidence that when you need to go to the toilet, you had to then go and empty it down in the street. So right. if you want water, you have to go down, get it in the street. And if you want to cook, you cook on braziers. So the place would have been full of smoke a lot of the time then, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Right. So this would have been a kind of a first stop lodging place for people when they arrived? I mean, if you went looking for somewhere to live and you'd come up from the country? Well, you're not in the sort of lowest of the low in terms of accommodation. Right. That would be further up. Right. There's another three stories from here. Yeah. And as you get higher and higher and higher, the apartments get more crowded and they're the places you don't get out of when there's a fire. The higher up you lived in one of these insulae, the lower your social status. The upper levels have gone now. But even one floor up gives an idea of this upside down social structure. You've just come in through the corridor into one of the smaller apartments. This would be it for a family. It's a tough existence because yeah. I think you have to think about everybody working. Child labour is, is a factor of Roman life. Really? So the children could be working as well as the father figure which you're setting yourself up to be. So this was a very, very basic life for ordinary people. No frippery, no element of sophistication. It was survival, right? Yeah. This is a... A quote from Juvenal, who was a satirist writing in the first century AD, the sick die here because they can't sleep, though most people complain about the food rotting undigested in their burning guts. For when does sleep come in rented rooms? It costs a lot merely to sleep in this city. I mean, what a commentary. You've come from the country trying to make a new life, displaced, lost your land, You've got your family here, there's not enough work, not enough money, the place is full of malaria, probably running alive with rats and other nasty things, and uh, here you are, you're stuck in it. An incredible 95% of the city's population was crammed into places like this, when they should have been working the land or fighting Rome's wars. 
Tiberius Gracchus began to hatch a plan. If he could reinstate the ancient law restricting ownership of land, it would keep the massive slave enterprises in check and free up smaller plots for homeless citizens. His goal was nothing less than to save the Republic from itself. But the bit that I really want to understand is the way that he went about it. Instead of using all the advantages of his privileged birth, he took a stand against the all-powerful Senate. Animosity between Tiberius and the Senate had begun with the peace deal he brokered in Numantia. This saved 20,000 soldiers' lives and made Tiberius a hero in the eyes of many. But the Senate saw things differently. They ruled that his action had made Rome look weak and they failed to honor the agreement. With his political reputation blackened and his family name shamed, Tiberius made a radical decision. He would not seek the Senate's approval to get his land reforms passed. He would find another way. So why didn't Tiberius Gracchus do things in the normal way and just submit his proposals to the Senate? He's very angry. He's very angry that he's been turned over by the Senate. Uh, he's very angry that they appear to have taken away his, his position, his face. The second reason is he's going to do something which takes away land from senators, possibly, and certainly friends of senators. So he thinks he's going to meet opposition. How radical were his proposals in terms of ownership of land? Actually, the original proposal isn't terribly radical. It's framed as a return to a previous law, which is already, by that point in time, a couple of hundred years old. He offers compensation. Um, it's quite gentle uh, as a piece of legislation. So he's not starting in a particular radical place. But with bad blood between Tiberius and the senators already, he knew they'd never comply. Instead, he deployed a cunning strategy. He would harness the power of the people. His plebeian ancestry allowed him to stand as tribune, a position created in the early Republic to protect the interests of the common citizen. His reputation as a people's hero meant that in 133 BC, he was easily voted into office. Tiberius knew that tribunes possessed a powerful but seldom used political tool. They could have legislation passed without the consent of the Senate, if it was approved by the assembly of the people. Understandably, many were afraid to go against the all-powerful Senate. Tiberius would have to win their support. All he had to do was to convince enough of the ordinary people that the reforms would be good for them which wasn't going to be very hard for him because he was already an accomplished public speaker. So he's going to give this big speech. Would he have been very, very particular about where he was going to give this speech? Ab or, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, location, location, location. Today, if you're speaking in Parliament or you're speaking in Congress, you're limited to those major structures when you're addressing the body of your constituents or the body of your peers. But for the ancient Romans, the big guys could call where they're going to assemble. And that means they could be in front of this particular temple or this statue and will give added weight and meaning to what they're trying to say. Everything in a Roman oratory is very nuanced and it's very deliberate. Addressing the People's Assembly right here at the Forum, Tiberius gambled everything on the speech he was about to give. Without their support, his land reforms and his political career would be finished. The wild beasts who roam over Italy have every one of them a cave or lair to lurk in. But the men who fight and die for Italy enjoy the common air and light indeed, but nothing else. 
House. All of our politicians and all of our cultures can give added weight to what they're saying. Everyone's using their hands. Lying lips that they're imperative. In here. Are they basically signaling what they're saying for maybe 10,000 people who, without any system of amplification, are going to be reliant on what they see, right? The Roman orators then would specifically use certain gestures that would be more visible, let's say, to a larger crowd that would add emphasis to what they're saying. For not a man among them has an hereditary altar. Not one of all these many Romans, an ancestral tomb. Basically, I think what they're doing is what we're doing today. But Tiberius Gracchus was one of the great orators of the Republic. So he would have used his body as much as he used his voice and his words. Wealth and luxury, and though they are styled masters of the world, they have not a single clod of earth that is their own. The power of Tiberius's words won over the People's Assembly, and his land reform was passed into law. But it was a victory that came at a terrible price. One thirty three BC. Tiberius Gracchus has outwitted the Senate shrewdly using the power of the people to get his land reforms made law. The masses hailed him as a hero, a champion who offered them hope. But the Senate now viewed him as an insidious threat. The battle lines were clearly drawn. Tiberius set up a commission to execute his law, but the Senate starved it of funds. Tiberius's next move was even more audacious. Rome was bequeathed a vast fortune by the death of a foreign king. Tiberius bypassed the Senate once again to claim these riches for the people. Now, ordinarily, a bequest like that would have to be accepted by the Senate. The Senate deals with foreign affairs. So for him as a tribune of the people to say, I accept, on behalf of the people of Rome, this bequest is to indicate that he wants to bring that resource in to be used for the benefit of the people. And clearly, it can help him fund his land redistribution and his compensation schemes and his grants to the people, etc., etc. But it also raises the spectre of the Senate losing control of foreign affairs to annually elected officers of the people of Rome. And that's dangerous. The war of attrition reached fever pitch. Anger turned to open hostility. With Tiberius's year as tribune drawing to an end, his followers began to fear for his safety. So they urged him to stand for an unprecedented second term. His opponents in the Senate cried foul, declaring it an illegal move. Tiberius ignored this and stood for election anyway. For many in the Senate, this was the last straw. They took it as a signal that Tiberius was seeking the absolute power of a king. And if there's one thing I've learned about the Roman Republic, it's that rex was a dirty word. Would-be tyrants had to be stopped at all costs. Tiberius is being forced into a more and more radical position because he's got no other place to go. We often talk about politicians leaving themselves an exit strategy. Tiberius hasn't left himself an exit strategy. On the day of the election for Tribune, Tiberius made his way to the capital. That morning, he observed many omens, none of them good augury birds refusing to leave their cage. A serpent curled up in his treasured battle helmet. A pair of ravens fighting on the rooftops above. Arriving at the capital, Tiberius was greeted with cheers and applause by his followers.
but the mood of celebration soon turned to panic. <laughs> Members of the Senate, Rome's oldest and most respected symbol of law and order, were baying for blood. In broad daylight, armed with clubs and sticks and bits of broken furniture, they brutally bludgeoned Tiberius Gracchus to death. So Tiberius Gracchus is basically bumped off. Yeah, it was more dramatically and more violently than that, he's actually beaten to death with planks with 300 of his supporters. It's a very grisly and dramatic end, and then his body is just chucked in the Tiber, like you do with a common criminal. You know, this is a man who had everything going for him, and he ends up being treated like that. And so was there an immediate reaction amongst the people? Did, because they must have been aware of the fact he was trying to do something for them, and then all of a sudden, their hero, as it were, is, is, is done away with. Was there any sort of response? I think, that, yes, there was a response, but at the same time, not everybody is behind him. Right. Rome is a very patriarchal place. It's somewhere where patronage is very important. So all of these nobles had lots and lots of people lower down the social pecking order who owed their living and who yeah. they were to yeah. these great lords. Yeah. So things don't happen that quickly, but what you're going to find is over the next 20 or 30 years, the Senate's going to have to change the way it sees things. It's going to be forced into a situation where actually popular legislation is going to come in and some land is going to get released to the masses. So what would you say overall is the result of his death? I think the death of Tiberius Gracchus was a real watershed moment because it showed individuals that they could go against the powerful status quo. They could go against the interests of this powerful clique by using the people in the popular assembly. And at the same time, it set a very dangerous precedent because the Senate deal with it by brute force, by violence. And what we're going to find in the next few decades, all the way until the end of the Roman Republic, is that the place becomes more and more violent. It's a really, really important moment. From then on, things are never going to be the same. I started off wondering what had driven Tiberius Gracchus to turn against his own class. But this chapter in Rome's history is about so much more. It's really about the deep fractures that started to form in Roman society as a result of their own runaway success. Tiberius had thrust these fractures firmly onto centre stage and shown that it was possible to harness the power of the people against the might of the aristocracy. This was a bold and powerful idea, one that would take root in the minds of others that followed. Next time, crisis in the Republic. As Rome descends into anarchy, one man plans to seize control for himself. His name is Julius Caesar.